To a small but dedicated group of UFO researchers, this barren ranch land, 75 miles northwest of Roswell, New Mexico, is sacred territory. It's the place where they believe one or more alien spaceships crashed to Earth sometime in early July, 1947. I think there was probably a mid-air collision that resulted in one going one way and exploding and dumping all the wreckage out in the debris field, the other making it down almost intact. Today, that crash, commonly referred to as the Roswell incident, is the stuff of legend. But we might never have heard of Roswell if not for a former nuclear physicist turned UFO researcher named Stan Friedman. After spending nearly 30 years investigating the incident, hunting down dozens of key witnesses and scores of top secret documents, Friedman is convinced that the U.S. government is covering up a UFO crash. This is his proof. It begins in 1978, when after giving a lecture on UFOs, someone casually asks if he's ever met former military intelligence officer Jesse Marcel. Brilliant investigator that I am, I said, who's he? I never heard of him. Oh, well, he handled pieces of the wreckage in one of those saucers you're interested in. What? Friedman tracks down Marcel in Louisiana and first hears the fantastic tale about the day Marcel helped recover a real alien spaceship. There were just fragments strewn all over the area, an area about three quarters of a mile long and several hundred feet wide. So, uh, Jesse tells me a story was in newspapers all around the world, but he doesn't remember the exact date. And he tells me how they took the wreckage to Fort Worth, Texas, and he was told not to say anything. Friedman checks with the local Roswell paper, and sure enough, there it is. July 8, 1947, Roswell Army Air Force captures flying saucer. It was a big sensational thing. Front page headlines, not just the Roswell Daily Record, which is kind of a small paper, but in the West Coast papers, Los Angeles Herald Express, huge paper, and so forth. But there's a follow-up story, too. One day later, a report from the U.S. military that the wreckage isn't a crashed UFO after all. It's pieces of a downed weather balloon. But now, 30 years later, here's Marcel telling Friedman the balloon story is false, part of a cover-up by the U.S. government. One thing I was certain of, being familiar with all our activities, that it was not a weather balloon nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else of which we didn't know what it was. In the weeks leading up to the Roswell incident, the country is gripped by UFO fever after a commercial pilot reports seeing nine strange objects flying over Washington state. He said that they acted like saucers bobbing or skipping across the water. It was from him that the term flying saucer came from. Hundreds of flying saucer sightings pour in especially in New Mexico, home to top secret test sites for V-2 rockets and atomic and nuclear weapons. The city of Roswell itself is the base of the 509th, the world's only atomic air squadron. Just two years earlier, it had dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If aliens were gonna be interested in anything that happened on this planet, boy, they'd make a beeline for New Mexico. As the story goes, on that fateful night in early July, 1947, a violent thunderstorm rolls through Roswell. Out in the desert, rancher Mac Brazel sleeps fitfully in his tiny cabin. There had been a big electric storm, and he heard what he thought was an explosion that didn't sound like thunder. The next morning, Brazel checks on his animals and notices they won't cross a pasture. He goes for a closer look and stumbles across debris littered over a large field. And he finds this huge amount of stuff, strange material, covering an area hundreds of feet wide by almost three quarters of a mile long. The material is odd, lightweight, but incredibly strong. Brazel carries a few pieces to his neighbor's ranch. Kind of a tan, light brown plastic. Brazel mentions other debris, Items covered with strange writing. He said the writing wasn't like Japanese writing, but it was, I imagine, more like hieroglyphics or something like that. 
The strangest material looks like aluminum foil, but with a weird ability to return to its original shape. If you picked it up and folded it, it would unfold. And if you folded it several times, it would still unfold. And you couldn't tear it. Brazel drags some of the debris to a shed. A few days later, he's on the phone with Frank Joyce, a local DJ and radio reporter. They began to talk about things that, that might be out of this world. I thought maybe this is a, a hoax. During the conversation, Joyce says Brazel mentions finding bodies in the wreckage. And one thing that he mentioned on the phone was the horrible odor that was with these bodies. Thinking Brazel might be insane, Joyce tries to end the call. I advised him to go to the U.S. Army Air Corps because they are flyers and will know what to do about anything that flies. Brazel does call Roswell Army Airfield. Major Jesse Marcel answers the phone. Marcel reports the call to his commanding officer, who orders him and a counterintelligence officer to go investigate. He says, go out with him, because the rancher said there's a whole mess of this stuff out there, and nothing that he brought in was conventional. At the ranch, Marcel is also puzzled by the debris. He gathers it up and heads back to Roswell. He's so excited by the potential discovery, he stops by his home after midnight and wakes his wife and 11-year-old son, Jesse Jr. He said something like, uh, this is parts of what we feel is a flying saucer. Jesse Marcel Jr. is a doctor and colonel in the U.S. Army Reserves. He just got back from Iraq. He's writing a manuscript called Roswell, It Really Happened. Even though it happened many years ago, he still vividly remembers what his father showed him that night. I picked up the material and it was, I noticed it had a very strange quality to it. It was very light. I didn't try to bend it or tear it, uh, but I just kind of looked at it and just kind of wonder what this was. Marcel's father continues on to the base to report his findings to his superiors. The next morning, the base commander orders the public information officer to write a press release about the incident. He gave me exactly what he wanted in the press release, that we had in our possession a flying disc. The story hits the airwaves, creating an instant sensation. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. But almost as quickly begins what appears to be a government cover-up. From the time that story came out, I felt that someone somewhere was trying to stop every last word of this story. 